Hi, I'm Ryan. Hey, I'm Nate. Hello, I'm Steve. And today, the Dungeon Vets are doing a party talk. This is going to be the second iteration of our fantasy draft from the Super Smash Brothers Ultimate roster. Uh, Ryan and I play Smash commonly. We like the game, and so we're going to use these characters from a wide range of fantasy and science fiction backgrounds to make some cool D&D characters, to make some cool adventuring parties, and then to pit them against one another in a random series of scenarios to include an exploration, social, and combat encounter. Nate is going to be our judge today, the Honorable Judge Signasty, and... And I do not play Smash, so I yeah, can't be biased. Exactly. He is objective as can well, be. Well, except that I like Ryan better, but it's... Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? You and the Nintendo uh, system have something in common because it uh, did some machine manufacturing to allow him to draft first this time. Is that how it happened? Again. Again, by the way. <laughs> um, the couple of quick rules, I believe everyone is uh, familiar. I say everyone's familiar like we've been doing this everyone for years. Everyone knows. Everybody yeah. knows. Uh, but, you know, you have to try to stay true to the character. You know, Donkey Kong isn't casting spells, basically. Uh, and Bowser isn't a variant human. So, uh, other than that, though, variety and flavor is always great. We encourage that here on Dungeon Vets. Wait a second, so, I have a question. Oh. If I can find some art on the internet that shows Bowser as a human, can then I use him as a human in this? No, I don't want to see that art. <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> see it. <laughs> All right, but anyways, um, Nate, is there anything you want to say or add before we get going? Being the honorable judge. Uh, Y'all are going to be level 10 once more. What we're going to do is, after we're done with our drafts, each of you have your team of four. Each of you is going to be allowed to pick one member of the other's team to cut. I feel strongly about this. I think Jeez. I've just got such a well-rounded. If I get all the people I want, because who knows? Yeah, I kind of, I kind of so built a four-person team. Mm, well. <laughs> as this is the second round of our, uh, of our doing this, we can't pick any of the players or the characters that we picked from the right. first round. So that's eight characters already out. Yes, um, there will be a roster up on the screen. For you guys to see who's already been drafted. The if you're listening, then the characters who are not going to be available this time are Zelda, Palutena, Snake, Ike, Roy, Greninja, Hero, and Robin. They are off the board. I know who several of those characters are. <laughs> okay. Well then, uh, <laughs> all right. So it's my for my turn, right? Yeah. So let's go ahead and move forward with yes. the drafting, and so let's see who each of y'all end up with, and who you lose. All right. I pick Rosalina. Mm, okay. Okay. Princess Rosalina, known to have uh, or been described as exceedingly intelligent, has lots of magic, capable of uh, flight, force fields, telekinesis, all the crazy magics. So despite being kind of spacey and maybe not super fantasy, more sci-fi perhaps, uh, she is quite magical. Very well. Okay. And so what um, What class exactly is she? She's going to be a wizard 10. Wizard 10. What type? Uh, transmutation. Transmutation. To make okay. use of her uh, size alteration abilities that have been shown in several of her games, teleportation, stuff like that. Yeah. Very yeah, neat. Cool, 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 cool. All right, Steve, who have you got? My first pick is Cloud Strife. He is a great warrior and leader and swordsman, but he's also very capable with uh, that game's version of magic. And so he's going to be a blade singer wizard. Mm. Is it Cloud? Is that that guy what has the gigantic sword? Mm -hmm. Gigantic two-handed sword? Yeah, isn't that him? He wields it with one hand, commonly. Oh. <laughs> and so it is. We'll just say that it's made of a special metal. Oh, will we? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he wields it with one hand. It has to be. I'm going to allow this. All right. 
And I think that it's worth noting that his, like, sword doesn't do any more damage on just, like, a jab strike in Smash Brothers than somebody else's one-handed sword. It, it is equalized a little bit. And we are drafting from the Smash roster, not from their original games, for what it's worth. Okay. Two wizards to start us out. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd have thunk? <laughs> yeah. Well, every single time we do this, it's going to be cast. always the magical game. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. Good. I'm really excited for like round eight, nine, and <laughs> ten and stuff. That's going to be fun. Bowser Jr., Ganondorf, <laughs> and Kirby. Captain Falcon and Kirby. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I wonder what class you make Captain Falcon. Obviously Monk, right? Because he punch. Speaking of Monks, my second pick mm-hmm. is uh, Sheik. Hey. Mm. Rogue okay. 3, Monk 7. I know that one. And it's a yep. Shadow Monk, isn't it? Uh, yeah, so it's an Assassin Rogue Shadow Monk. So Ooh. she can use a bow, a variety of weapons. Uh, she is as sneaky as sneaky as can be. A lot of burst. Yeah. A lot of burst. A lot of burst. Yeah. Uh, as far as the current D&D rules go, anyway. Indeed. Which is what we're using. All right. Very good. Steve, your second pick. All right. With my second pick pick i choose link link okay classic i know that one then you're well acquainted with this he ranges all over the countryside he is so he's a blade singer. he's proficient <laughs> with a variety of weapons <laughs> uh, he is proficient with a variety of skills too but mainly it's about exploration and infiltration and so he is a ranger, and his specific subclass is Monster Slayer because he slays monsters. The whole thing yeah, about Link is, <laughs> yeah, finding the specific ways, the secret weak spot in the monster. So he's a he's a Dungeoneer's pack kind of. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, very good. On to round three. Yeah, so uh, this is going to be one of my favorite characters, and it's going to be Dark Pit. And you might think of him as a villain, but uh, throughout the events of his games, he generally becomes a neutral character over time, even refusing to side with any gods, good or evil. So he's not evil. He just uh, he thinks about what he does and uh, the choices he makes. But I made him a Paladin 8 Fighter 2. Paladin 8 Fighter 2, okay. Asimar, fallen Asimar, because he is an angel. Makes sense. I can see the parallels there. Very good. Trying to pick up that action surge for like level two, huh? Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We're at tenth level. You know, I don't. You don't get a whole lot for going straight ten. Okay. All right. So talking about picking up an action surge, my next pick is going to also be one of my favorite characters in the game. It is Byleth. Byleth is a very capable and intelligent warrior, one that teaches as well as demonstrates their skill and is shown to be proficient with a whole variety, a whole host of different weapons. And uh, that just screams D&D fighter, singer. battle master. <laughs> God damn it, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> He's a battle master because somebody who carries a bow, sword, axe, and spear is a battle master. <laughs> and whip. Well, he doesn't carry all those in his game again we're drafting from the smash brothers roster again we're being faithful to the games like bowser okay. can't be a very inhuman very well i mean what do the DD rules say about this as long as it's within his carrying capacity he carries nothing else only his weapons i'm just saying is all oh you're just saying is all huh i'm going to allow this all right well for my last pick speaking of action surge I picked Krom, who is a uh, Fighter 8 Paladin 2, which is the opposite of Dark Pit. Uh, but he's going to have the great weapon fighting and interception fighting styles to show how he uh, puts himself in front of uh, the attacks to save his allies. Uh, he has a tough feat to augment that interception and a small lay on hands pool. So he's got a lot of health and uh, with the tough feet, and he's able to just use that massive pile of health to uh, take hits for allies. And then heal them right after with a nice lay on hands. You know, unless Steve takes him away from me. Perhaps. 
Steve, perhaps your final pick. My final pick is Pokemon Trainer. Pokemon? And this is a little bit of a different iteration from a lot of these other characters because most of the time the, the characters that are listed on the screen are also on the stage fighting. But in the case of Pokemon Trainer, he or she is using their Pokemon to fight for them. And so the the person on my adventuring party is the human Pokemon trainer who is a circle of the shepherd druid. Makes sense. And the Pokemon are the summoning fey creatures and animals that the druid brings forth. And with like the third level feature, you get like the bear spirit, unicorn spirit, or the... Uh, the whatever the next one is, and that 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 right there could just be Squirtle, Ivysaur, and Charizard. Uh, and there are different ways in which these different Pokemon affect the battle and can help teammates and stuff like that. D- just like a Druid is very multi-dimensional, all the way I level like, ten. Uh, I like uh, uh, Pokemon. <laughs> okay, so each of you have your four party members. And now, each of you will get to select one of the other's party members to remove. If you'd like, you can describe how they're removed. (laughs) Okay. Okay. (laughs) I like that a lot. So, uh, Ryan, since you drafted first, we're going to let Steve cut one from Ryan's team first. Ryan, remind us who you've got. So we've got Rosalina, who's a wizard 10. Uh, Sheik, which is a rogue 3 monk 7. Dark Pit, Paladin 8, Fighter 2, or Krom, Fighter 8, Paladin 2. So I choose to cut away removing all of their abilities to survive in the blackness of space and they drift off forever is Rosalina. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. That is the that is the logical choice. Does make sense. So that leaves That's... me with an ungodly power to just kill anything in one turn. <laughs> That's going to uh, that's going to have a significant impact on your team dynamic there. Well, Ryan, All right. What have you got in response? So we got Cloud, who's the Blade Singer, Byleth, the Fighter, Battle Master, and Link, the Ranger. Pokemon Trainer, the Druid. All right. Um. So I think you're missing a lot on damage. I think Byleth and Cloud are your most damaging creatures what is uh can i know what cloud's intelligence is how do you feel about that nate i didn't ask any questions yeah you know what why why don't you get this over with brian (laughs) okay yeah sorry um i'm gonna get rid of byleth so you don't have mm, mm. he really wants this win he's really thinking this over i've lost like every time you're the uh every time you're the judge that's not true because you beat me last time yeah well i thought i beat you in smash last time no, you beat me in the in this too. Cause remember, it was the Roy well, Ike battle. In order to keep my hold on, in order to keep my undefeated streak, I want to think about this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think I'm going to take away Byleth and what I believe to be will a lot of be a lot of your damage. All right, all right. So with that, you each have your parties of now three. And we will move on to see which environment we're going to be adventuring in. Very well. The dice have spoken. What do they say? The following encounters that we will be rolling for are going to be taking place in a setting of freezing cliffs, sharp, jagged edges, bitter, biting, cold, icy wind, threatening to send you off the side at any moment. Lots of elevation to play with. So, think about how each of your parties are going to be able to best deal with this environment and the things they might encounter in it. There could be flying creatures attacking you at various moments. You might find some caves to take shelter in, but find that there are already some things living there. Who knows? The possibilities are endless. So... Steve, since you picked the other thing first, I'm just alternating here. Ryan, why don't we hear how your party deals with the freezing cliffs first? 
All right. So I don't have three humans walking through a frozen tundra. I've got a magical angel man, a half elf, and a human walking through a frozen tundra. And uh, these three um, are, phew, let me tell you, <laughs> well equipped to go through. Yeah, do the, uh, do the tell me. Wasteland. Yeah, tell me exactly about that. That was the question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when it comes to gathering food, uh, we don't have magic to rely on, but we do have a half elf who uses a bow and an Asmar who also uses a bow. Uh, uh, my paladin actually is able to use a bow just as well as a fighter because of those fighter levels. And between them, they have all the dexterity needed to be able to hunt, so food's taken care of. For uh, maybe finding a bear of some type in like a cave what do we know about the cold and people who live in the cold they like to wrestle bears which takes a lot of athleticism all three of my characters are proficient in athletics so any bears that may be in any caves who are not able to just uh, be persuaded to leave uh, they can be submitted um, through various wrestling moves you're gonna make the bear tap or yep oh. Yep, the consensually tap and leave the cave. Careful of the claws when they... Um, I do have the ability to fly with Dark Pit, so I can uh, scale these great cliffs. Dark Pit can go all the way to the top and drop a rope that is able to get everybody else uh, from the bottom to the top or any other such similar obstacles. Uh, additionally, it's often dark in the tundra because of the... Uh, I mean, if, if this is an Earth-like tundra, I suppose... And I have a character who can straight up just teleport from shadow to shadow. Which uh, could actually make getting through and scouting far distances in the uh, in the tundra quite easy. So it would take some thinking and take uh, some creative survival without the use of magic. But my team is nonetheless able to survive just fine. So you say. Okay. You make a case. Steve. How does your party of three handle the freezing cliffs? Okay, so my party, whew, let me tell you. <laughs> um, yeah, do. So I have, I have a team that re that is really well made to handle any sort of exploration. Uh, Link is renowned for going into any sort of territory and being able to just, like, find food and find stuff in any sort of territory and being able to acclimate to that by getting necessary gear and all this kind of stuff. He's very uh, innovative. He is also, like I said, he's a ranger. His class is made to be able to handle these sorts of things. He adapts well. He has a climbing speed. He has spells that can help to be able to find shelter, find food, stuff like that. Talking about spells to be able to help with that sort of thing, that's all that the Pokemon trainer is. Uh, we can just bring out Charizard and stand around his tail for a campfire. Um, speaking of fire, it is very cold. Uh, Cloud is a blaster. He's going to be able to just make fire for the party to be able to probably with his blasting ability, make shelter in the side of a, of a mountainside, things like that. So with all of them being able to really handle themselves should danger arrive, and with all of them being pretty capable in just being able to trek through the wilderness because Cloud is also proficient in athletics, Pokemon Trainer can summon any sort of beast to be able to help and turn into a beast himself or herself to be able to help uh, with exploration, food finding, combat. Now, there is something you said that I want to address first. You mentioned bringing out, what was it, a, char a Charmander or something? Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a little bit more See, of a joke. See, you know that? What's, uh, what's, oh, okay. what's, uh, what's That's, a Charlemanjo? Okay, what is that? What's, what's the yeah. stat block <laughs> on yeah, it? Are you talking about bringing out Charlemagne? <laughs> no, no. Because of that, I just remember that one episode in from the TV show where Ash is caught in the cold and they're all huddled around Charmander's tail, but then he gets tired and his, his flame is starting to go out. Oh, I remember that. Yes, episode. see? I told you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I will consider each of the arguments that you have made. Can I make a, uh, can I make a quick comment? I am trying to consider... <laughs> what?! <laughs> 
Now you claim that uh, Link has all these amazing skills. Uh, from which game are you describing this Link from? Breath of the Wild. Now, if you uh, if you'll <laughs> allow me to ask, hey, go ahead. I've watched a lot of people play Breath of the Wild, and uh, and I've uh, I've played it a lot myself. And you know what Link often does when he goes into adverse environments that are too hot and too cold? He dies, Steve, and you have to start over. You can't so, start over in D&D. Once your character dies, now they're a detriment to everybody else. And you think that bringing a character who dies often when they go into the cold is a good idea? I mean... I think everyone just learned a little bit more about Ryan's playstyle in Breath of the Wild than we learned about Link's <laughs> abilities. <laughs> I don't want to go and get a bunch of cold herbs to make me feel warm in the cold. I just want to go fight the monsters. <laughs> I mean, but Link has been, they've been making him put on certain outfits to do certain things for years, oh for decades. Oh my God, and the noise when he's close to death, it's just that constant beeping that would bring me down if I was traveling around with Link. But the point is that he, like I said, he's adept at recognizing that and getting the appropriate gear and stuff that he needs. Because he's freezing. That's how he knows he's cold, is that he walks into an area and he's... You're just describing... Barely able to stay conscious. Like, abilities. Like and Link's poor ability to prepare. <laughs> and what does he do about it? He dies. What is Krom doing? He's got like light leather armor and his arm exposed. That's gone. Frostbite took it. Oh no, he can heal himself. And you know what? If Link doesn't have his parka, then he'll just snuggle into like the polar bear that Pokemon <laughs> Trainer summons. All right. Okay. I have considered each of your cases, and now we'll move on to. Combat and social encounters. Now, typically in the past, we have gone from environment to social and then combat. I'd like to possibly stir things up a little bit here. Um, I'm going to roll for each of our social and combat encounters. And I'm going to see if maybe one should come before the other. Maybe we should do combat before social this time. Okay. okay. Or maybe it'll keep the same. It'll just depend on what the rolls are. But Roll it. I'm rolling. Okay, this works. I have our combat and our social encounters, and I have decided that we are going to do combat first. Ooh. All right. Uh, now, this combat, I think, is going to be pretty interesting. But it's also going to be interesting trying to fit the social encounter into the environment, but that'll come later, <laughs> because first we're doing combat. So, as you're trekking, through these frozen cliffs, you're each trying your best to to survive, make it through the cold. You start to get into um, sort of a, a rockier area, and you're seeing a lot more of these smaller caves and things like that. You see a lot of these, a lot more of these flying creatures around that you've that have sort of been pestering at you every now and then. Until eventually, you come around a bend of one cliff, and you see a very large cavern. In fact, it almost looks like the, an archway has been made into the side of the mountain. It looks a little too smooth to be natural. As you come upon it, finally finding what looks to be some decent shelter, perhaps you would warily approach, first seeing nothing, you come upon a door. Around this door are scrolled some glowing blue runes that flash brightly when you approach. Curveball. First, we're going to see which party can solve a riddle better. Okay. I, I, I came up with this in the middle of me talking. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. This is part of our social encounter. Call it that, even though it's not yet. But All right, what's the riddle? Flash, uh, this is a lightning round. Hastings, within two minutes or less, explain why your party is better at riddles. Actually, uh, you already went first. Steve, you go first this time. Okay, so I have a I have a wizard, very intelligent, 
very adept at insight and investigation. He is proficient in insight and arcana. Show us. His intelligence is an 18, for the record. (laughs) And uh, I also have Link, who is very adept at solving puzzles and riddles. It's baked into his game. And Pokemon Trainer is all about solving problems to, you know, help Pokemon thrive, which having a variety of different animals to summon or turn into to be able to help. And a 10th level druid has crazy amounts of spells. Okay. Rand? Speaking of Link, uh, Sheik in the Ocarina of Time has to basically hand feed Link all of the information that has to do with his plot because he's so stupid and uh, can't do anything unless he has a giant arrow pointing in a certain direction. But not only that, uh, she's a princess. She is a uh, princess with lots of training and is uh, basically been trained to make and solve problems her entire life. Her entire kingdom uh, has been under siege by Ganondorf. Similarly, Krom, uh, he leads the Shepherds, which is a, a military group in the uh, Halidom of Elise. He leads it and he solves problems all the time. He comes from a tactical fighting game, not a fighting game, a tactical fighting game. And uh, I don't know how much time I have left. So Dark Pit, he is dealing with cosmic <laughs> cosmic problems between gods. So he doesn't take his decision-making lightly. He is uh, well aware of... Uh... <laughs> Why are you guys laughing? <laughs> um, making important decisions and uh, finding the wisdom in the situation. How does Sheik go about solving problems? By using Link to do it for her. Using easily molded, <laughs> stupid people. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I have heard you, and I have determined that each of the parties were able to successfully solve the riddle. <sighs> oh, thank goodness. Wait, As did one you... of us do it better? No, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> Not this okay. time. Maybe something else will. Or maybe okay. I do have in mind someone that did better, and it'll influence a later decision. You're right. I will just keep putting forth maximum effort. Thank you. And maybe minimum chit-chat while I'm trying to describe the combat encounter. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so each of you are able to solve the riddle, and it's like in the minds of Moria. Uh, and then it opens, and then there's a kraken behind you, but not really in this case. Instead... You open and you feel this warm breeze, uh, sort of this warm uh, uh, gust of air come at you. And you're like, oh, warm shelter, finally, at last. This seems amazing. As you enter in, the doors slam behind you. And you see a glowing, crackling form that raises into the air and says, How dare you disturb my studies? (laughs) We're going to be fighting an archmage. All right. Uh Kudos, DM, on the lead up to this, the description and everything. <laughs> Best one yet. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> Thank you. It's this is no um, it's no easy foe, and they're they've got a lot to throw at you, and a lot of ways to get away from you, even. Um, and so we're saying we're kind of fighting in this very large, open kind of chamber. Um, that he, like I said, he has rose up into. So you know, there's there's definitely some some uh, ceiling space to work with here, uh, both for the archmage and possibly your party. So, Steve? Okay. So I would I would like to just amend something earlier that I said about describing Link only from the Breath of the Wild. Uh, Link has been in many games, and he is the same Link, the one Link. So I have all of those experiences. This sounds a lot Wait, like no, not. the end of Hushu. This sounds a lot like the he's end not. of the Ocarina he's not. of Time. All right? You're lying <laughs> and... to the judge right now. <laughs> Order! Order! (laughs) You can use your character's video games as a a backstory element and something that could influence your characters, but they aren't getting abilities from the games or even necessarily exact experiences. Stay in the line. Okay. So, this is a huge part of what Link does. He goes into weird environments and then successfully kills a monster. So he is very adept at finding the weak spot, being able to determine the Archmage 
their capabilities and the layout of the big cavern to be able to find the best way to support his other two uh, companions, which are a little bit more direct. Uh, Cloud is blasting away with big explosions and the Omni Slash and stuff, and he's a blade singer, so he's using stuff like Steel Wind Strike to be able to really do damage and to be able to maneuver around the room. And he also has access to things like Misty Step and stuff like that. So mobility-wise, Cloud is right there. Link has his bow and his ability to hit the weak spot, so he is able to still attack even if he is like hiding and then popping out or going around the back and things such as that. Pokemon Trainer in this instance, in this instance, isn't going to pull out one CR2 creature. He's pulling out all six Pokeballs and bringing them all out and, you know, summoning a bunch of uh, woodland creatures or elementals and so that he can cover space and that he can help uh, fight any sort of like ice minions that the Archmage might be able to summon up and things like that. And should they not, then he is just also able to focus directly on the Archmage and Druids can do tons of damage. They are they are very support driven, but their ability to summon creatures, the like Pokemon don't play, you know, like the the those hydro pumps and those flamethrowers, they hurt. And so But they yeah. don't kill, do they? That's why Cloud's there. That's why Link's there. <laughs> Teamwork. Okay. Okay. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Did that sound like the, the Legend right, of Zelda I, I noise? Got I got it. Yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> Ryan, how is your party handling the Archmage? You don't rise to the ranks of an Archmage without uh, having killed another few wizards along the way. You would know how to fight magical opponents. You'd probably be prepared with things like Counterspell and maybe even things like Silence, which is something that Sheik packs in her kit. Um, we are in a big open mood uh, room, sure, but if this thing is throwing this, just sounds like to me, I don't know why I imagine a gnome archmage just by the way you... Uh, it was the voice. Yeah, the voice. <laughs> but he's like a gnome archmage who's throwing a big fireball as we as we walk in. Uh, fire is has light. Light makes shadow. Shadow allows Sheik to teleport. Um, shadow or Sheik can just teleport straight to the Archmage and cast Silence, um, which has 120 foot range, and she can concentrate on it. Once that tiny squishy mage is is silenced, I now have two fighter paladins who are able to close that distance, and both are able to axe and surge. Both are able to smite. And just absolutely knock the snot out of this uh, out of this here archmage. However, if it doesn't, let's say it's not that easy. Krom has the ability to take hits for everybody, and in order to uh, get into position, it might take a couple turns. But my party is well capable of taking hits. Not only that, they all have range capabilities, including the uh, Dark Pit, who can shoot his bow just as well as any other fighter. Uh, despite also being a paladin. He has access to the command spell, which can get a couple resistances maybe out of this archmage. Uh, but Sheik also has the ability to, uh, with daggers or bow from a range. And with both of their uh, high dexterities, it shouldn't be hard at all to hit. Hmm. Okay. You have each given me quite a bit to consider. Very well, very well. So... As each of your parties are starting to, to whittle down this archmage, you feel that victory is near. He lets out a mighty cry, or a desperate cry, rather, as he moves, or rather teleports, over near to a, a table where you can see he's got books lying all around and various devices. And he looks back at you, and you can see as he does so, and he's holding something, and his form seems to be shifting before your very eyes one moment he's a gnome and then he turns into a, a human in fine clothing and then the next a dwarf in armor and he just keeps sort of shifting for a moment as he screams and he throws the object there is a huge bright flash and you are all knocked over and for a moment the world is black until finally you come to and find yourself somewhere entirely different no longer in 
the large chamber that you fought the Archmage in, but actually you're laying in a patch of grass outside what appears to be groups of tents set up. You hear music, laughter. This looks like a fairgrounds. And as you're sort of blinking the, uh, you know, the, the flash and the unconsciousness out of your eyes, you think you see someone scuttling off towards the, uh, the groups of tents. So our social encounter is, you need to figure out within the fairgrounds, who is the Archmage? Or where is he hiding? All right. Okay. Okay. The, uh, the, the implication I was trying to give is that he's likely disguising himself as someone else. Sure, yeah. Okay. All right, so uh, when it comes to finding this, this guy, uh, it is a bit of a mystery uh, finding a what is possibly a gnome amongst lots of gnomes, perhaps, or just someone with the ability to, uh, to disguise themselves. Uh, first thing I would want to do is uh, possibly not be noticed. Uh, Sheik has the ability to uh, cast Pass Without Trace on the party, and they can go about uh, trying to figure out where the gnome might be from afar, maybe even setting a trap or something like that. Uh, perhaps we would set Krom out and be like, looking all obvious, and then when he might be attacked or otherwise uh, affected by the gnome casting a spell, I would have my two other characters able to lock that gnome down with, uh, say, silence yet again, or... Um, command, but also, given how this is a possibly a social encounter, and we're in a big fairgrounds with lots of people, I think my party would be well equipped to talk the gnome down out of combat. We have Krom, who in his game, Fire Emblem Awakening, actually starts in a field of grass, so that's a nice little parallel there. Who would have thought? <laughs> Don't very intentional. Um, <clears throat> yes, very intentional. <laughs> uh, he is a prince, and he is a very peaceful prince. Uh, he doesn't want anyone to die, and he would certainly see all these people around, and similarly to Sheik, as a princess, would not want any uh, damage to come to these people. And a wizard can, you know, just synaptic static and kill all of these commoners in but a moment. We also have Dark Pit, who uh, is a redemption paladin who is able to use his uh, channel divinity to give himself uh, where is it? emissary of peace, which gives himself a plus five bonus to persuasion checks for the next 10 minutes. And he would want to use his ability to be an em emissary of peace to really calm this guy down and stop him from uh, putting anyone in danger. Not only that, but if, uh, let's say, the gnome does get wily after he has been found, we have rebuke the violent, which we can strike back at him so we would use not only our smarts but our social social prowess from uh, each of the games that we're from very good very good steve so <clears throat> link from his games is very adept at figuring out where to go who to talk to what the right thing to do is. He's not super charismatic. He is not going to be able to say the anything to, you know, really be able to convince anyone here, but he's very good at garnering information. Everyone he talks to, he learns something about something, and he furthers his way towards the right answer. Okay? <clears throat> and should he have already done something pertinent, they may say something different. <laughs> All right. But anyways, Cloud is a wizard. He is he is proficient in Arcana and Insight. And being a wizard, he has access to lots of spells, just being able to change it out in his book, to be able to move around the camp, talk or the, not camp, the carnival, talk to people and, uh, and be able to see deeper than just the surface level. Pokemon Trainer can summon animals that can then track things down by smell or by by some method other than just this visualization that is trying to be passed off. Um, Pokemon Trainer is also from his games, 
from his TV shows, very good at garnering information and getting to the right answer and figuring out quests and the answers. And being a druid allows him lots of maneuverability as well to be able to like turn into an animal, to be able to hide and sneak through and spy on people. Link is also very good at stealth. He's proficient in stealth, very good at spying on people, overhearing things that they don't want him to hear in order to get the right answer. And with their with all of their abilities and their varied abilities too they're just going to move through the camp and be able to figure it out okay as i uh to do my final considerations y'all have given me a lot to think about this one is not easy does any do either of you have any final closing remarks you would like to make yeah i do all of my characters have Sheets and sheets and sheets of dialogue from their games, all able to talk to people, actually talk to people, and possibly even ask questions of Anything people. Anything that pertains, I see what you're doing, anything that pertains to D&D, or at least your these characters within the context of D&D. Yeah, so no, legitimately, from a social encounter, I think uh, the types of people that my characters are, we would use our persuasions and others uh, to ask uh, the fairground peoples, if they've seen anything strange. Okay. Steve. I think for each encounter, I've, uh, I've left it out, left it all out on the table. I don't have much more to add. I, I would just say that the thing that sets my team apart is very well-rounded and so very capable of handling any sort of little wrinkles that may pop up in the specific scenarios you mentioned that we didn't really have time or ability to address is that capability in the unknown all right well the hypothetical trophy this week is going to ryan Woo! let's go baby all right how's your party gonna get anything done when none of them can talk to each other steve <laughs> they're just a bunch of mutes traveling around and they don't know what to do oh but wait when Byleth was there? No, Byleth is a mute too! No audio! <laughs> yeah, this one, I have to say, though, was picking a winner was not clear and, and simple, uh, in my opinion. But I think Ryan barely eked it out. Um, a lot of that comes from the... I, I liked the, the, the cases and the arguments that he was making a little better. Honestly, it's the characters themselves, not the D&D like if we look at the D and D classes, Steve wins. That's kind of, of that was that was was really giving me troubles. I think if we if we sat down and rolled these out and went to a table and did this stuff, I think Steve's party would probably come out on top by a little bit. But if they were piloted by normal D and D players, yeah, yeah. But I liked some of the creativity that Ryan came with. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm sure that there are gonna be people listening to this that disagree with my decision, um, but. It is final, and you're wrong. I don't want to hear it. No. Just kidding. I do. Tell you're me right. all about it. You're right. Don't worry, guys. I'll send you his address. Flood him with letters. <laughs> <laughs> Bring on the hate mail. When's the last time you wrote some uh, hate mail? <laughs> I've never written hate mail. <laughs> I, I know. I haven't either. But Literally it's like... never. If you've ever written hate mail, you don't need to follow us. <laughs> <laughs> if you've ever written hate mail but have since changed your ways... But are feeling like you want to write some hate mail. Bring it on. I'm happy yeah. to hear get it. it. Get it out of your system. I'll yeah. send you my address. But it has to be literal. It has to be like snail mail. Like, you got to post me this Yeah. Stuff. We will delete all emails and direct messages. E a, a piece of paper, though. I'll read that. <laughs> but uh, this was a lot of fun. Thanks for the great DMing, Nate. Yeah, this was best, I think, the best like DMing bit in a party talk so far. By far. Well, thanks so much for listening, y'all. I, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, if you agree or disagree with my decision, let us know. Um, also, please leave a like, comment, subscribe, do those things. Um, come check us out at DungeonVets.com. We've got uh, blogs, things like that over there. And if you'd like to work with us, leave us an email uh, or check us out on Fiverr. See you next time. Bye. <laughs>